Welcome everyone. I'm Sister Louise Lears, and it's my privilege to work on creation, care, advocacy for the Franciscan Action Network. This is our third webinar in our series, Working for Environmental Justice. And we are grateful to our sponsors, the Franciscan Federation and the Sisters of St. Francis of Philadelphia. As always, we begin rooted in prayer, and I invite Franciscan Sister Nora Nash to lead us. Thank you. Most high, glorious God, cast light into the darkness of my heart. Give me true faith, certain hope, and perfect charity. Give me insight and wisdom, so I might always discern your holy and true will. Shine your light, merciful God, on all the dark places in our hearts. In communities like Chester, where we grieve and mourn with the people who have been oppressed by environmental and racial inequality and injustice. Strengthen our faith in our encounters with representatives from the Department of Environmental Protection, Coventa Delaware Valley, and Penn America Energy. Inspire us with hope as we witness activists who courageously advocate for an end to environmental injustice. Give us the integrity, humility, and wisdom to seek right relationships, mercy, truth, and forgiveness. Renew in us, in each of us, a deep and passionate consciousness of our call to advocate for those who are disenfranchised in any way. Fill us with an abiding hope for the Chester community and gratitude for Chester residents' concern for quality living circle and the campus coalition concerning Chester. Most high God, we praise you in all of those on this webinar and in all creation. Amen. Thank you, Sister Nora, for starting us with prayer. We're delighted that you've joined us for this third webinar in our series, Working for Environmental Justice. In September, we focused on New Mexico, particularly Chaco Canyon and the Permian Basin in that state. In October, we visited Louisiana, specifically the area alongside the Mississippi River that has unfortunately been known as Cancer Alley. And now we turn our attention to Chester, Pennsylvania, home to residents' concern for quality living in a city that has suffered disproportionate effects of polluting industries. Let me give us an idea of how we'll proceed in this next hour. First, we'll watch a short slideshow and video about Chester in order to set the context. And then we'll have a conversation with Zuline Mayfield, Dr. Giovanna DeCiro, and Chris Folk about their advocacy for environmental justice in Chester. And we'll have an opportunity for your questions and your comments, and we'd ask that you put them into the Q&A box in the bottom of your screen. And before we close with prayer, we'll give some opportunities for those of us who live outside Chester to take action to support our friends in Chester. And you'll receive an email shortly afterwards with links to all the information so that you don't have to take notes or do screenshots. Now, I ask Sister Nora to join me in setting the context about environmental advocacy in Chester. Chester, Pennsylvania is a low income minority city on the west bank of the Delaware River between Philadelphia and Wilmington, Delaware. Chester is home to numerous polluting industries, 
including one of the largest incinerators in the world, operated by Covanta, Delaware County. Zulie Mayfield and the grassroots organization Chester Residents Concerned for Quality Living, also known as CIRCLE, have a long history of working for environmental justice. They were the first activist group to apply the Civil Rights Act in an environmental racism lawsuit. All of us have a moral responsibility to address the issues of environmental justice so that no one bears a disproportionate share of the negative environmental consequences as we see here, resulting from industrial, governmental, and commercial policies. Through court testimony, advocacy, and collaboration with other justice groups, Chester Residents' Concern for Quality Living has been successful in fending off some polluting industries from operating in Delaware County. The call to work for environmental justice has also inspired the formation of the Campus Coalition Concerning Chester, known as C4, which brings together students across multiple campuses in several states to support environmental justice campaigns in Chester. The trash incinerator in Chester has existed for over 30 years, but a new polluter has been quietly attempting to establish itself in the city. And America Energy is proposing to construct one of the country's largest liquefied natural gas LNG terminal in the city of Chester. There's a reason why communities fight these things, tooth and nail. My name is Aline Mayfield um, from the little city, mighty city of Chester, Pennsylvania. Chester is in between Philadelphia and Delaware. And I am the chairperson of the mighty, mighty Chester residents concerned for quality living. You cannot aggressively address climate. Uh, uh, it's not change, it's degradation. Um, it, it's no change to it. Um, and you cannot effectively address that issue unless you deal with what I believe are the primary uh, uh, sources to the degradation of our climate, which is happening in frontline communities, black and brown communities. Were it not for a dogged reporter who was um, eyeing this thing and saw fit to write a story, we still would not have known. This is how secretive this thing was. And to realize the magnitude of this thing um, and the different communities that it could impact, you know, getting it from where they frack it at down to our little community um, is massive. Originally, they tried to see if they could cite it in Philadelphia. To my understanding, it's been rejected three times. So after we got done with the press conference, we actually tried to go into the hearing room. They had locked the door and told us that there was no more room. At, at one hand, we try to applaud this administration, but on the other hand, they fall to the bullies. The Biden administration is, is sending some very conflicting uh, messages that they need to clarify. Either you are for the protection of people or you are not, or you're gonna to continue to rubber stamp industries that you know, you know are killing people. The 
forgiveness. With that context in mind, we have the pleasure of inviting three friends who have agreed to be with us today from Chester. And that is Zuleen Mayfield, who you just saw, Chris Folk, who was actually in one of the pictures and you might not have realized it, and Dr. Giovanna DiCiro, who was also in one of the pictures. Thank you, Zuleen and Chris and Giovanna for being here with us today. Let me introduce you to our participants just a little more fully. So Zuleen has led the environmental justice group Chester Residents for Quality Living since the early 1990s. And she formed the group to address concerns about concentration of waste facilities in her city, Chester. Zuleen's dedication to environmental justice earned her the NAACP Sojourner Truth Award, as well as recognition from the city of Chester for her advocacy on childhood led poisoning. Now, Zuleen, a question I have to ask you right here at the start. So Chester residents concerned for quality living. The acronym is CRCQL, sometimes pronounced as circle. Is that accurate? Yes, right. yes. So for our for our guests here today, if we refer to Chester residents as circle, those are the same thing. Chester residents, yes. what would you live in? Thank you. Chris Folk is a student at Swarthmore College and a proud member of the Campus Coalition Concerning Chester, also known as C4, and Chris is showing us his t-shirt. Chris and the other members of C4, they draw on access to college resources to support the environmental justice efforts of the Chester residents. And in turn, Chris states, and this is a quote from Chris, Chesterites teach us what we cannot learn in the classroom. This past summer, Chris joined two other students interning with Circle, or Edward did an internship with Circle this past summer with two other students. Dr. Giovanna DeCara, DeCiro, excuse me, is a professor of environmental studies and the coordinator of the Environmental Justice and Climate Resiliency Program at Swarthmore. And this program is committed to forging and supporting diverse campus community collaborations. And Giovanna has published widely on environmental and climate justice. And we are thrilled that all three of you are here with us today. Zuleen, I'd love to start with you. You've led this grassroots organization known as Circle since the early 1990s. Can you tell us the story? How did it come about? And how, what has been its focus through the years, through the decades? <clears throat> well, you know, we, we formed in 1992. Uh, primarily around the um, what they called the trash to scene facility. That's what they marketed it as, and that's what they labeled it as. And that marketing was very good because even now to this day, people will refer to the incinerator as the trash to scene plant. We mm -hmm. formed primarily on everything that you could see here and smell. Um. That is what got the residents um, up in arms and very concerned. They did not like uh, the huge amount of trucks that were rolling up and down our city streets, um, trash coming off of the uh, trash trucks. And, and they're normal trash trucks that you would normally see in your neighborhood. It's a small component of them, but primarily they're 18-wheeler uh, 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 tractor trailers full of trash. And it, in, in the early times, it would have leachate liquids. You know, the kids used to call, call it trash juice that would just roll off of these trucks onto our streets. Um, we had at one time pictures of rats jumping off of the, the, the trucks. And um, that's what really got the community in the neighborhood, um, initially very um, concerned and angry. Later, you know, when we learned what it was, that's when we started getting into the technical aspect of what they did and what they produced as far as pollution and where it went at, which was primarily on us and in us. So that's what got us started. And that's what has, has kept us 
<laughs> uh, continuing to fight and to shut that incinerator down. It's a nasty, nasty um, uh, 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 facility. And when it came, it kind of opened the flood doors or put out a beacon to other waste polluting facilities that wanted to come to Chester, that did come to Chester, um, and who we have had to actively fight. Um, so that's primarily how we got started and why so, we are continuing. So Zuline, why Chester? You said so that Covanta uh, Trash and Center would open the doors for many others. Why Chester? Why not someplace there, else? There's only one primary factor. And, and before it was Covanta, um, it's changed hands a couple of times. But initially, this was a, a collaboration between Delaware County Council at the time and Westinghouse. They were the first operators of the incinerator. We have never, ever been able to determine who reached out to who to put that facility in Chester. But we do know that we had at a time a, a very corrupt mayor who actually went to federal prison for corruption. He came straight out of jail and helped broker the deal um, when there was um, tension between the county and Westinghouse and the city of Chester and other entities involved. He came out and brokered the deal. And, and primarily, you know, part of our lawsuit looked at, it wasn't the fact that Chester was, you know, getting permanent for waste facilities. We were getting everything in Delaware County um, was being permanent in our city. And at the time, the, the research that we did, we could find no other factor outside of race on why that was happening. You know, Chester's five miles. Chester is not on most maps. So surely there was a collective effort to bring those facilities to the city of Chester. Mm -hmm. And we know that they came because uh, at one time there was something called the Cerrell Report, C-E-R-R-E-L-L -L Report. And this report was commissioned by incinerators and, and waste polluting industries. And they asked this company to find out what factors should they look for when they were trying to cite uh, 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 an incinerator or a waste recovery facility or whatever name they want to use. And the key factor was, you know, it should be a black or brown and indigenous community. It should be a poor community. It should be a community that is viewed as being politically powerless. My goodness. It should be a community that does not have a good educational system. All of the markers that was in this report, we met all of them. Yes. But boy, were they wrong. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say. And then Boy, did Chester they learn a little bit. Right. Then there's Chester residents' concern for quality of living. I remember hearing one quote from you on a video that I watched where you talked about the trucks that were coming starting at two o'clock in the morning. Truck yes. after truck after truck after truck. That is a quality of life issue for anybody who's listening to those trucks hour upon hour upon hour. Yes, and it's also a financial component. Due to the amount of truck traffic that comes, um, there's a real economic issues that, that surrounding that. A lot of the homes have uh, uh, foundation damage. Mm. Mm. You cannot keep your cars clean, so you have that added expense. Mm. You know, there's the pollution that comes out of the stack of the incinerator, but there's also the ground level pollution that comes off of these 18-wheeler trash trucks. Mm -hmm that lingers and just lingers in the community. Thank you, Chris. There are so many ways to be involved in a college campus. What is it that led you to be involved with C4 and with Circle? Um, well, it started with Professor DiPiero's environmental justice theory and action course. Uh, and that course, half of it was normal reading and learning in the classroom, but 
the other half of that was uh, we were formed into different groups and each group was doing something to help uh, circles. Uh, oh, I, I'm not coming through clearly. Okay. Um, we were trying to, we, each of us were doing different activities uh, and groups and projects to help circles mission and as using this as a way to reboot C4 because C4 had um, fallen by the wayside as the pandemic had disrupted the normal flow of college. Uh, my group was working on hosting a youth event and uh, we planned all semester and then at the end of the semester uh, at a um, beautiful venue in Chester called the MJ Freed Theater, we hosted an event where um, kids of all ages, but a lot of like kindergartners and first graders came out and we had coloring pages uh, featuring the Suleen and other uh, change makers inside of uh, Chester. And we talked about the environment and um, how the environment was not just about nature and trees, but it's, you know, uh, taking from environmental justice um, uh, theory and community uh, insight. It's, it's where you live and you work and you play. And we brought in their conception of the environment and asked them what they wanted to see in the, the future of their environment. And, you know, unanimously, they wanted to see uh, a clean environment, uh, one where trash wasn't strewn across the streets, uh, where their homes are, were beautiful and they were not worried about gun violence and uh, their city was somewhere they wanted to love and live and work and play. In. Um, and, you know, uh, Professor DeKiro and Ms. Zuleen are uh, very kind and caring people, but they're also, they have very high expectations. Of, <laughs> so make sure we're on top of it. So um, it, I think um, it's been very rewarding the past few years to work with um, the two of them and uh, all my peers and just see some of the amazing things that happen when we all are here on a collective mission and um, putting in the time and effort see it through. And Chris, I read the article that you wrote on um, Circle's website, and I think you have some pretty high expectations too. Good for you. You said that the Chesterites taught you things that you can't learn in the classroom. Just give us a few of those examples. What are those things that uh, the Chesterites taught you, as you said? Yeah, I mean, I think there's just the, the value of um, just loving your community, um, you know, I think, and and why you you have to love your community um, and seeing the beauty in Chester that comes from all the, every single Chester I you meet, they love their, they love their city. They're very proud of it, which is not something that is, you know, that's not the narrative about Chester outside of Chester. It's um, just portrayed as this, uh, play like you talk to I talk to a lot of people and I'm like oh yeah I do a lot of work in Chester and uh, go into Chester a lot and everyone's like oh be careful you know that's a dangerous place but when you go there it's uh, this summer I was uh, working with um, uh, brother Tyrone Ricks and we were doing a, a, a landscaping beautification um, project going to various senior citizens homes and uh, you know, every single person was just so happy to have us there. And they're giving us cold drinks and ice cream and just, you know, <laughs> cheering that we would come by and uh, whack some weeds down and uh, trim the lawn. And, um, you know, I think, and, and you just hear about the politics in the city, you hear about the history of the city, and you get to understand, um, you know, it, it's one thing to read about the Covanta incinerator or, um, other other facilities in a book, but it's another thing, um, you know, if you were, if you go to like a tour that Miss Uline leads um, and you get to see, you know, the house that uh, she's since abandoned, but that was across the street from the incinerator and realizing, you know, th there was no other choice but but to fight and to, to start this and, um, you know, all from a, a love of the people around her. And yeah. Thanks, Chris. So Giovanna, the, the uh, city of Chester and Swarthmore are fairly close together, right? They're not that far apart geographically. So why did Swarthmore become involved in environmental injustices in Chester? What, what was it that started that 
that collaboration? Yes, well, um, so Swarthmore, of course, uh, was founded by Quakers. So Swarthmore as a college uh, sort of has, um, uh, at least theoretically in its DNA, the focus and the commitment to social justice. Um, and, uh, but because Swarthmore is also a, a very elite institution, it sort of embodies that classic ivory tower um, sort of phenomenon where you kind of do your high theory in the classroom, but you the, the you don't really encourage students to engage um, outside of the bounds of the beautiful arboretum that the campus is. Um, but I think that a lot of uh, faculty and staff and students are very much interested in um, the commitment to engaging with and collaborating with local communities. So over the years, people have um, uh, uh, worked with our neighbors in Chester um, around a, a host of, of issues. And, and I think that it is incumbent upon our institutions of higher education to, um, to you know, not stay in the ivory tower and instead to see education as um, going beyond those border zones. And, and I think, you know, Chris gave a great example of how that um, crossing boundaries, crossing borders, um, working with Circle and other uh, uh, Chester residents um, really does expand the power of, of education. And, and I think that um, education needs to be more, uh, it has to be more than um, critical thinking. It also needs to be critical engagement and critical action. So I, I see uh, the work that we've been doing together as a way of really challenging what, what is education for. And that's really, uh, I think, what many faculty, many um, programs at Swarthmore now are thinking more seriously about what it means to do purposeful education. And 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 the students, I mean, in my experience, you can see I'm uh, just extremely proud of Chris and all uh, of the other students who might take, take a course one semester, get involved with Miss Suline and other Chester residents. And then uh, that kind of sparks something. Uh, uh, and they're thinking about what they think is important and how they actually want to blend their studies with engaged action. And and I I think it's it's a um, it's a sign of the times. I think that students are really um, hungry for the opportunities to build relationships, build community. And, and build their futures, really, build their futures in collaboration with communities who are the ones that are most directly and negatively impacted by the unsustainability of our systems. Mm -hmm. um, and so students like Chris, I mean, Chris also studies religion and so has a strong moral and ethical and spiritual component to their life and to their belief system. Um, many of our students do as well, and they see the importance of being uh, of being focused on social and environmental justice. And um, and I think that they uh, sort of in in some ways take Zuline's um, uh, what Zuline often says when she works with my students is that while the pollution and the harm may immediately um, and more seriously impact the residents of Chester because they live right next to the incinerator and their air is, uh, the concentration of pollution is worse. But Zuline always says, don't think that you're living in a bubble because the pollution doesn't stop at the border of Chester and Swarthmore. Right. Right. And so we all have to see ourselves as interconnected and we all have to see ourselves as creating that, that future that that we can all um, 
uh, you know, strive for. Absolutely. Yeah, Sabine, you want to add anything here about C4? Yeah, oh, let me tell you about C4. Uh, my young adults, I have to stop calling them my kids. They are second to nobody. They are second to nobody. It, a C4 should be replicated um, at many different college campuses. Um, they have to have a hard for do the administration. But the young adults, um, their commitment to putting the work in is second to nobody. Second to nobody. And, you know, sometimes I always have, okay, it's not important for you to go to this meeting. You are in college. That your parents or somebody is paying for. So yes, you must go to class. You don't have to go to this meeting. You don't have to go to this protest. But that is the dedication that they do. And what they offer, you know, this is a a really true collaboration of students and real life practicums that they will get from Circle Side. Um, they have resources that we need, that Circle and Chester residents need. They have access to information that and 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 systems that we don't have, and they are willing to to use what they are learning and 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 the tools and the systems to help us. But we are also teaching them about life and about what they need to do you know you cannot look at the world in one viewpoint it's a circular vision and everything is circular Suleen let me ask you this um I, I read a lot about the the liquefied natural gas plant so that's something that's particularly you're particularly focused on at this time is that accurate Maybe we focused on everything. <laughs> <laughs> Can you talk about that a little bit? Because that's one thing that I see a lot. Well, of we, <laughs> you know, for example, I got a call today about immigrants being dropped off again. And so we had to go and go research that, you know, which is a non, um, that's something different. Well, the liquefied natural gas. Okay. Apparently this man, uh, the CEO of it, Mr. Frank James has been slithering around the state for about four, four or five years. He's met with everybody. Governor Wolf, the, the, the Department of Economic Community Development, the secretary there, the one under the Wolf administration. And they're telling me the current one. I, I had a, a meeting a couple of weeks ago with our new school superintendent. And our school is also under receivership because it's financially mismanaged or not doing well financially. He had even met with the new superintendent at our schools. She's been in her position for 41 days. So he is really, um, you know, they do what they do. They, they buy politicians that buys them policy that makes it easier for them to get these things cited. And that's what this process is about. Um, he had met with our soon to be no longer mayor. Um, and we had discovered from research that C board members did that he had contributed $15,000 that we could determine came directly from him. Um, but you know they donate under names it could be his wife name his cousin name his children's name so those are the things that they do and we were able to go to city council with that and i essentially busted the mayor and i told him you know we understand that you received fifteen thousand dollars in campaign uh donations from mr frank james at pen america please don't let that influence your decisions and he was fit to be tied so that, those are ways that research that a C4 member can do that we don't have bandwidth or time, but that's something that they're good at doing, researching and giving us the information. And that's a way that we can use the information. Now, 
this liquefied natural gas of all the things that Circle has ever fought, and we fought a lot. We defeated three um, companies that wanted to burn trash in our community, including Kimberly Clark, better known as Scott Paper Company, which is also in our community. They also wanted to burn tires. Um, we had the largest autoclaver of chemotherapeutic infectious medical waste in the country, sitting right next to the largest incinerator in the country. I mean, literally right next door. Um, we had two facility soil remediation systems that burn contaminated soil. And another one, uh, Cherokee Biotechnology Company, they burned contaminated soil. Um, up to, they wanted to put the largest pet crematory in the nation in Chester. Now, once again, I'm going to tell you, Chester is five miles. That's it. That's it. With 33 to, to I'm saying 36 or 37,000 people, because we know we were undercounted. So it's a very densely populated community. Um, this LNG, once again, we would have the notoriety of having the largest LNG on the East Coast. This thing would be massive. Um, and it is scary. Of all the things that we fought, this thing wakes me up at night. It makes me go a little bit harder, as we say, read a little bit more, want to put more information out there to get the community and communities surrounding Chester involved in this battle for years. Um, Chester Residents Concerned for Quality Living has fought these battles, and we've offered people in Swarthmore a measure of comfort because they have not had to fight these battles. We've been on the front line and because of what we've done, it has created a level of comfort for them. They can literally breathe a little bit easier because had Circle not been formed, I have no idea what uh, uh, Delaware County or the city of Chester would look like had we never got into this thing. Um, because all of those companies I named, guess what? They're not in Chester. Right, right. And Timor. So we defeated seven of them and countless other ones that may have wanted to apply and didn't apply for a permit or uh, no, we'll have no, we'll, let's move on. Let's go to another community because Chester is not it. But for some reason, this guy at PEN America, LNG, is hell-bent on putting this thing in Chester. And we are hell-bent on um, giving him the resistance. Right. I did so good, I didn't even cuss. <laughs> <laughs> I'm proud, y'all clap, that's good. Let me ask Chris a question here because it, it's, it kind of comes off of what you just said. Chris, when, when, I, when we hear about climate anxiety, we often hear about it in relation to your generation who has some real sense of anxiety about the climate. So can you speak to that a little bit, first of all, about climate anxiety in your generation and how we transform that, which is what you're doing, Circle is doing, C4 is doing, into climate action rather than leaving it at climate anxiety? Yeah, what can you tell us, Chris? I, yeah, I, I came into um, doing work with Circle through C4 uh, in a moment a period of my life where I was very, very anxious and depressed and scared. And, you know, not all of those feelings are completely dissipated, but um, I think a lot of that stems um, from kind of the way we understand, uh, my generation has come to understand this problem as a, a global issue. Um, we learn about it through these disconnected sources. Um, it's it's this abstract, we, we see this global system that is producing these consequences and it's difficult for us to understand how to like fit in and uh, do anything to change because we feel so isolated, so small, um, so powerless. Um, and then we, you know, coming into Professor DeCiro's course, you get to learn about decades of, of people who are fighting these systems who are, you know, 
putting in the energy and the effort and and or, winning and winning and winning uh winning for decades and continuing to win and um you know, I, I still see this as a, a, a global fight. You know, th this LNG facility is coming uh, with money from all over the world, from all over the country. The, the It's flowing from the other side of the state. Uh, it's connected to the LNG uh, energy sources, uh, ener the facilities in Louisiana and uh, Circle has made connections with people there and made connections with people in Germany where this energy, with uh, this LNG, all these resources would be flowing. And this is part of a global system, but we can't necessarily fight at a global scale. We have to each fight where where we are, right? And that's the, the important part. And one of the most important things that both of these um, amazing women have taught me is that we have to be embedded in our communities and be willing to fight to, to remain in place and remain connected to place and connected to community. Um, and that is like where, where you start from. Um, Chris, thank you. Let me ask each of you quickly, and then we want to get to the questions that our participants have. So we'll make this like like fairly brief. What gives you hope? You're, you're cool. talking about some pretty, what gives you hope? I mean, these are some pretty big issues. As Chris said, this is global. This no, is well, listen, listen, hope mm -hmm. comes and goes. Um, but you have to keep new energy around you. For me, anyway. I need Chris. I need the young people in C4, but I also need my elders in my community. The oldest member is 91 years of age. Okay. I deserve to fight for her because she at one time fought for me. And we have to always remember that these, these are not, I tell the students this all the time. These are not microwavable battles. You know and win, okay? These are battles that you have to be 10 toes down in the community at all times. And the hope is with all, we have bought multi-billion dollar corporations. Yes. Billion dollar corporations with throngs of lawyers, uh, uh, marketing people, money, and the politicians that that money can buy, and the agency, uh, uh, uh agencies, and uh, uh, positions that the agencies will take because the politicians put pressure on the agencies to do a certain thing for their polluter friends. We have fought against all of that with very little money capital. But we fought with a determination that nobody can beat us. That would give me Because hope. God is for us. And he wants what is righteous. And only he could have kept me in a battle like this for 30 years. Hmm. I don't you. want to do it for another 30 years. <laughs> That's why a Christian is more important. But I don't want to hand them the baton of an incinerator. Right. So I can see us closing it. I'm telling you, that's the hope. That's the hope. You know, if you look at it as a global thing, you'll never defeat you'll never defeat it because it looks too big. Yes. But I will wake up, okay, this day I got this energy in me. Now it may not be in me later on the night. I might be crying on the floor. But today, right now, I'm gonna give them all the hell I got. <laughs> I'm gonna invite Janine. <laughs> On that note, and if you, Janine, could start with the question about what gives hope, and let's hear, like, briefly <laughs> from Giovanna and from Chris, and then with the other questions that people have. Thank you, Janine. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you, Sister Louise, and thank you all for uh, being with us. Uh, Giovanna, what, what is your, what gives you hope? Well, I mean, I think I, I kind of expressed it earlier that um, hope, I, I think hope is active or hope needs to be active. And um, and so hope is about building re relationships, um, working in community, crossing those boundaries, refusing the distancing and the separation that happens. 
um, seeing ourselves as interconnected. And I see, you know, when when young people and elders alike um, see uh, that see the the ways that we can build connections, then a certain kind of enhanced excitement and energy happens. And that's I I see that as hope. And beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. Chris, what what gives you hope? Uh, learning about the history. You know, Circle is an organization of winners. Uh, and we're going to keep winning and they're going to keep winning and we're going to keep fighting. And um, just the track record speaks for itself. And Miss Uline's unwavering faith and energy in this fight, you know, is just a shining beacon to, I think, everyone in C4 and everyone around her. So uh, Miss Uline and Miss Uline's track record of taking W's. Well said. Well said. The key, Chris, <laughs> is tapping that in, tapping that out of you. I'm I'm not extraordinary. What's in me is in you. I love that. I love that. Zuline, we had a question actually for you. You yeah, testified yeah. at the Philadelphia City Council recently. Uh, what was that like? Were there that you mentioned multi-billion dollar companies? What were the representatives from uh were representatives from the company that operates Covanta present? Is that well, oh I'm sure they're that. present and they gave um they had oh my god well this is to deal with philadelphia sends about 30 percent of the trash that's burned at the incinerator they have an actual contract with covanta to burn philadelphia's trash um a councilwoman up there they want to revisit that uh contract so they are taking testimony to try to get different uh the, the communities that are impacted mainly chester because it only goes to chester they wanted our viewpoint on why it should not happen so i gave testimony um it's a big step that philadelphia is taken taking um mm -hmm. to even explore this and to try to come up with a uh, a zero waste uh, mechanism where they could divert that trash and not send it to an incinerator. Um, deal with it zero waste wise and also landfilling. So they are actively exploring that. We have been able to actively get our county, Delaware County, and the Delaware County Solid Waste Authority to start a mechanism in place. So within three years, they will no longer be sending in trash to Chester. Um, and the way we did that was, you know, how can we go to Philadelphia? and land based them for, for poisoning us with trash when our own communities are doing it. So mm -hmm. it's been resonating. Um, the uh, Covanta um, incinerator sent two people I'd never heard of or seen before to give testimony. They had also tried to incorporate some of the small um, nonprofit groups that they've given money to to come and speak on their behalf um they didn't they were on the call but they didn't get to give testimony uh, like i said um <laughs> i think that um it is a good step but i have to think that we have to continually to push back on all of these things and we have to be able to walk and talk and chew gum at the same time and live life mm. so you know Today, we're capable of all of that. <laughs> well said. <laughs> well said. Uh, this question actually might be for both Chris and uh, Giovanna. I'm not sure who, who would be better to answer it. Swarthmore recently hosted the Students for Zero Waste Conference. Uh, can can one of you tell us a little bit about that conference or both of you? Yeah, so, so actually the conference was hosted by the... Um, organization called post landfill action network but it was or it was sponsored by them and it was held at swarthmore college it that that's a college based organization that that organizes college students across the country to address the issues of environmental racism and waste colonialism and and alternatives to a uh, uh to waste incineration and the waste stream and um, the conference was kicked off by a 
an environmental justice tour led by Zuleen and me uh, in, in Chester that had about 30 um, young people from across the country. So that, that was really great. But one of the things that the conference really uh, is interested in doing is blending the that environmental justice focus on both challenging or fighting things like incinerators and LNG export facilities from coming into marginalized communities, but at the same time, building alternatives, envisioning and building and imagining and sharing alternatives. And, and so that is something that uh, through Chester's or through Circle's um, youth program and and programs like the Good Energy Collaborative, which is a one of a, a Circle and Swarthmore uh, based organization that's growing to, to think about um, what are alternatives to incinerators and to our waste uh, our, our wasteful society and to, um, you know, challenging fossil fuel infrastructure and instead looking at solar futures and renewable energy. Um, so we want to look at those both together. And that's something the Zero Waste Conference um, is, is also hoping to bring to the picture. Wonderful. That sounds terrific. Um, Chris, I'm hoping that you can answer this next question. Can you tell us a little bit about your event this Saturday, the 18th, the They Matter event? Uh, I think this would be my <laughs> Oh, is that right? <laughs> you didn't do your work. <laughs> <laughs> Zuli? All right. Um, on uh, the 18th, we were ha having an event called They Matter. Um, and one of the residents said, and Circle Cares. Um, so we've added that, but it's called the They Matter event. And, you know, one of the things that we wanted, that I personally wanted to address is whenever we go out where you hear um, governmental entities or um, um, the Delaware County Health Department talk about residents in Chester in statistical ways. You know, 38.5% of our children have asthma, 29% may get ovarian cancer, blah, blah, mm -hmm. blah, 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 blah. And I think that is so callous and so um, void of, of, of a personal touch. Mm -hmm. You talk about like we don't even exist. So the event on Saturday is to have a celebration for those uh, members in our community who have died from cancer, um, those that are battling cancer currently, and those who have survived cancer. Mm -hmm. Our intention, intention is to put a face to those statistics um, because we are not statistics. We These are our relatives, our mothers, our fathers, our husbands, our wives, our children. And we're going to have them come in and we're going to do a little memorial. Um, uh, we're going to have pictures of the people. We're going to set up a table and we're going to give out two awards. Um, one award is called the Geronimo Award. That was my mother's nickname. Um, and she died of cancer. And I'm going to give uh, a person that award who reminds me of my mother's personality and the other one is called the Zoraya Award. Um, Zoraya was a young lady who was a mentee to, of mine and at one time I moved to California when I came back she was sick with a rare form of leukemia mm -hmm. and after she had had her I think her baby boy was like nine months old when she died um, but this young lady's life she wanted to be a doctor. She wanted to do this. And she was doing the darn thing, but she was having babies in the, in the, in the meantime. But her spirit and her energy to learn from me was so great. Mm -hmm. And two of her children are on our board members. Her, her two babies are now mm -hmm. board members of Circle. Um, so I want to honor that young lady. But more importantly, I want to show the world that these are not statistics. These are people in our community that we have lost to cancer, 
um, who are battling cancer right. and who have survived it. And the C4 students are going to make some type of visual tribute that we're going to put on our website to acknowledge and to show this and to show that no matter what we, there is still life. Mm -hmm. There is still life. Amen. And we have to be defenders of it. That's the know? truth. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Um, I am so sorry that we did not get to all of our questions, but we are uh, conscious of the time and want to respect your time. So thank you, Zuline. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Giovanna, for your time today. And and at this point, we're going to uh, have a few minutes with uh, my colleague, Gabby Martinez, who's going to go through some advocacy actions for the rest of us who uh, live outside of Chester and how we can support the Circle residents. Hi, folks, and thank you, Janine. I will take a minute to briefly introduce the actions and events, which will also be contained in an email shortly following this webinar. First is the They Matter event um, to join the Chester community in prayer on November 18th um, to honor all those in the community who are affected by and have died from cancer. There will be prayer and tribute. If you can't attend, check out the visual tribute on Circle's website and join them in prayer on Saturday. Next is comment to build a strong environmental justice standards in PA. The Pennsylvania Department of en Environmental Protection is seeking public commentary on the revision of environmental justice policies in an effort to make them stronger. Please submit your comments before November 30th. Next, we have the thank Pope Francis and tell Be President Biden and the EPA to take bold climate action. Um, this is a petition to thank Pope Francis and urge the administration and EPA to cut pollution and expedite our transition away from polluting fossil fuels. In terms of upcoming events, we have um, asked people to sign up for the environmental newsletter that comes out every month. It's called The Current. It's part of our ongoing environmental justice campaign, and it will contain environmental news, actions, and events each month. Lastly, our January 5th Faith and Democracy Interfaith Vigil, which will be hybrid. This is our annual event to remember the anniversary of January 6th attacks on the Capitol and would, will be held again on the evening of January 5th on the Capitol grounds. We invite you to join us either in person or online along with faith leaders to pray for our democracy as we head into the 2024 elections. More information will be released closer to this event. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your continued support and involvement with FAN's environmental justice campaign. And I will now turn the camera to Sister Pat Millen, who is a Sister of St. Francis of Philadelphia with the Franciscan Federation for our closing prayer. All powerful God, you are present in the whole universe and in the smallest of your creatures. You embrace with your tenderness all that exists. Pour out upon us the power of your love that we may protect life and beauty. Fill us with peace that we may live as brothers and sisters, harming no one. God of the poor, help us to rescue the abandoned and forgotten of this earth so precious in your eyes. Bring healing to our lives that we may protect the world and not prey on it. That we may sow beauty, not pollution and destruction. Touch our hearts of those who look only for gain at the expense of the poor and the earth. Teach us to discover the worth of each thing to be filled with awe and contemplation to recognize that we are profoundly united with every creature as we journey towards your infinite light. We thank you for being with us each day. Encourage us, we pray, in our struggle for justice, love, and peace. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sister Pat. Thank everybody tonight for joining us this evening. FAN will continue to focus on environmental justice in 2024. 
So stay tuned for information about future events and webinars in our newsletter, The Current. And let us continue to pray and to act for peace and justice. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.